ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. สวัสดีครับ And for those uh, who are joining from other parts of the world, good morning and good evening. Thank you very much for joining us for the Jula Futures Literacy Week International Conference. I'm Jessada Salatong from Jula Nongkorn University, your MC today. It's my great honor to welcome you all to the virtual conference connecting communities through Futures Literacy. Solidarity and transformative learning in a post-COVID-19 Asia. Since beginning on February 28th, Jula Futures Literacy Week has held public lectures, a book talk, a Futures Literacy Lab. Jula Futures Literacy Week is an initiative of each of us to work toward a future that is just and sustainable, reflecting on the global commons. We are joined by academics, students. Civil society practitioners, local and international organizations, policymakers, and government officials to reflect on our emerging challenges and activate meaningful discussions on regional governance of sustainability with justice and dignity at its core. Today, we culminate the week-long program by gathering for the international conference. Now, may I first of all invite Professor Dr. Professor Dr. Bandit U A Pon, President of Jolong Kwan University, to give welcome remarks. Professor Bandit, please. Honorable guests, distinguished speakers, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to address you all on behalf of Jolong Kwan University, and welcome you all to the culminating event of. Jula Futures Literacy Week, with generous support from the UNESCO and the Thai National Commission for UNESCO, and our old and new partners, colleagues, and friends from across the region and the world, Jula Long Gon University is honored to be able to convene Jula Futures Literacy Week to create space for mutual learning, knowledge co-creation, and solidarity-like actions for better futures. Ladies and gentlemen. During this week alone, yet another devastating development is transpiring in the world. At this very moment, can we possibly think of a timely and more important topic than building human capacity through future literacy? As much as the pandemic has affected us during the past two years, this latest development will also impact us all as this unfolds. And grave consequences are revealed. Humanity will be challenged again and again. How can we overcome our limited imagination, which are defined and constrained by national and short-term interests, in the face of the increasing complexity, pace, and interconnectedness of the challenges and change that confront us? How can we be better equipped to navigate the further changes that lie ahead? I believe you will all agree with me that we need innovative and new frameworks of thinking and action. We need transdisciplinary, cross-sectoral, cross-generational, and cross-cultural collaborations. Academics, policymakers, business leaders. Civil society leaders, youth writers, religious leaders, artists, philosophers—it requires all of us to be involved and active, and to align our effort for better futures. Jula Long Gon University is committed to generate and support innovations for society, to strengthen multi-stakeholder collaboration, to serve society at large. We are working to transform our institution and ourselves, which take reimagining and redefining the role of universities to serve the broader public good, to serve the global commons. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here to share insights, to reshape our vision, practices, and strategies toward transforming governance and institutions for global sustainability. We are here to discuss system improvement, to support work toward sustainability in Asia and beyond, with the values of justice and dignity at its core. 
in working towards such a direction, it is our civic and collective responsibility to promote humanity, respect for each other, and most importantly, compassion. To continue with this journey, Chulalongkorn University has become a member of the UNESCO Global Future Literacy Network since our participating in the 2020 High Level Summit for Future Literacy. I am most grateful that today we are joined by the UNESCO Chairs for Future Literacy, Future Studies and many of our engaging partners across the globe to address the matter of foremost importance to us, connecting communities through future literacy to transform our governance for global sustainability. In closing, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to all the speakers, panelists and facilitators who have kindly convened together with us to create meaningful engagement to work toward a better world. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my deepest appreciation to our co-organizer, the Thai National Commission for UNESCO at the Ministry of Education, Thailand, represented today by Dr. Supat Champatong, Permanent Secretary for Education and Vice Chair of the Commission. My sincere appreciation also goes to the UN Resident Coordinator Office of Thailand, headed by Ms. Gita Sabawal and the UNESCO Future Literacy Team in Paris, headed by Dr. Rial Miller, who have provided us with the, their most generous support in co-designing several key programs, including the Future Literacy Labs. Thank you very much for joining us for the July Future Literacy Week International Conference, and I look forward to our meaningful and noble deliberation over the next two days of the program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Bandit Yuan President of Jolongkorn University. Ladies and gentlemen, next, it is my pleasure to invite Dr. Supat Champatong, Permanent Secretary for Education, Ministry of Education, Thailand, and Vice Chair of the Thai National Commission for UNESCO. Please welcome Dr. Supat. Ms. Jolanin Ongsak, Chief of Mission for the International Organization for Migration in Thailand. Dr. Rio Miller, Head of Future Literacy, UNESCO. Professor Dr. Bandit Uaapon, President of Chulalongkorn University. Professor Dr. Vitit Mantaphorn, Chulalongkorn University's former UN independent expert and member of UN Commissions of Inquiry on human rights, executives and experts of Thai and foreign university and international partners, distinguished speakers and guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Ministry of Education of Thailand and the Thai National Commission for UNESCO, I am honored to be a part of this international conference including the public lectures and special workshop held prior today and hosted by Chulalongkorn University. The topic of the world event is uh, connecting community through future literacy, solidarity and transformative learning in the post-COVID-19 Asia. It's in line with the need to recover our society by all sectors collaborating and sharing their knowledge and practice. The spread of the COVID-19 pandemic and the advancements of digital technologies has disrupted the world at an overwhelming rate. These factors will have long-lasting effect on all sectors and education is no exception. The change coming in the future require education to prepare learners for a world of rapid change in new technologies, new connectedness, and new forms of employment. Therefore, we need 
a more flexible education system that is responsive to the rapid change and external factors by offering various learning approach and lifelong learning curricula in line with the unique potential of each individual learners. In this regard, education was forced to evolve and adapt to a blend learning model with a heavy focus on a digital and distant learning approach. Among the negative effects, the advancements of using digital technology and innovation may count as a positive one. However, it reveals the growing digital divide that requires all sectors to work together to narrow this gap. As well as this, there are a number of unprecedented things and situations that are happening. In light of this, we need to prepare well to manage them in the best way, using the knowledge, experience, and best practice we have learned. During these trying times, we must all remember that the ultimate goal of education is to develop the capability of human resource by supporting all the learners with knowledge and essential skills for the 21st century. Not only how to acquire and provide quality education for all, but how to make it sustainable and lifelong, which is our responsibility as education providers. If we prepare and plan today for the future, that means we will achieve a future society where everyone has obtained the skills to strengthen the capacity to cope with challenge and unforeseeable situation that may occur at any time. July Future Literacy Week show our collective effort and cooperation in solving this challenge. With the support of UNESCO's participation program in Thailand and the assistance of Chulalongkorn University, the Ministry of Education and the Thai National Commission for UNESCO, in collaboration with national and international partners, we have successfully made the event happen despite the pandemic situation. Future literacy is one of the competencies and approach we believe will help our society to achieve these goals. This is a great time to enhance and expand our collaboration by discussing the way to utilize literacy skills and let everyone realize its importance and how to use it properly. This will not happen unless all stakeholders and relevant sectors cooperate with one another. At this juncture, we would like to take this opportunity to convey my appreciation to all the participants and honorable guests and speakers of this meaningful event for their participation. I would also like to pay special thanks to UNESCO as our supporter and Chulalongkorn University as the main host and organizer. I am sure this event will be a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Supat, for your kind opening address. Thai National Commission for UNESCO is the co-organizer of Jula Future Literacy Week project, and Jula Longkorn University is more grateful for the guidance and support we have received, which led to this initiative. Ladies and gentlemen, next, it is my great honor to invite our keynote speaker, Professor Emeritus Vitit Mandrapon. Professor Vitit is a professor emeritus at the Faculty of Law, Jula Longkorn University. He is a barrister at law and teaches international law, human rights, and related subjects. Professor Wittit has held a number of UN posts, in particular, UN Special Reporter on the Sale of Children, Child Prostitution, and Child Pornography. 
UN Special Reporter on the Situation of Human Rights in the Democratic, Democratic People's Republic of Korea, UN Independent Expert on Protection Against Violence and Discrimination Based on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. He was the chairperson of the UN Appointed Commission of Inquiry on the Ivory Coast and a member of UN Appointed Commission of Inquiry on the Syrian Arab Republic. In 2021, he was appointed as UN Special Reporter on the Situation of Human Rights in Cambodia by the UN Human Rights Council. Without further ado, may I now call upon Professor Richard, please. Futures literacy and the reframing of education in Asia and beyond. An introductory tale. Let us start with a friendly tale. A personal dilemma arrived at my doorsteps the other day. Should I compel my students to switch on their cameras? when learning online? The argument in favor is that the switch on enables the teacher to check for class participation and to have some eye contact, which is a valuable part of education and socialization. The argument against is that some of the stu students are in precarious and difficult situations. They might not own a computer or are forced to share a computer due to lack of money to buy a machine. Or they might be in a location where they are too timid to show the view behind the camera, which could expose too much of the privacy which they need to safeguard. So what is the solution, please? After discussing this puzzle with several people, I opted for a compromise. Dear students, please switch on the camera unless you have a good reason for the switch off. And please provide a reason for the camera switch off. Flexibility, rationality, empathy and necessity interlinked with education and socialization somehow blended to find a pathway together as part of our pedagogical process and the all-rounded literacy to which we aspire with a future pending and impending among all of us. The term futures literacy thus offers the opportunity to reframe the panorama of education, especially because COVID-19 has accelerated our process of adaptation. This is especially important for the Asian region because it is the most populous continent, blessed with a huge number of children, but also ironically replete with a variety of political systems, ranging from democratic to authoritarian. There are also key lessons for the world beyond. Online education, whether singular and or hybrid, has become the norm in many settings, despite the acute paradoxes faced by humanity, particularly our children, along the way. Some have access to online, while others do not. Some have the means to buy new technology befitting online education, while others do not. Old disparities are compounded by new anomalies with age-old poverty aggravated by the advent of technological deficit and related lack of access. Yet, the point of underlining the basic ingredients of education is to enable ourselves as humans to develop with 
a longitudinal perspective. Call it the uh, anthropological challenge. Meanwhile, there is the interface between our existence and the surrounding environment, with a capacity to be risk conscious and risk ready, testing our survival to the limit. Call it the ontological challenge. In reality, we should not forget that there are already some instruments in the existing educational toolbox which can be well used, while we also need to prepare for and respond to innovations and drivers of change in the perhaps brave new world. Let us then cast a glance at the reflections from the two-sided mirror. Side one, futuristically existential, and side two, existentially futuristic. Futuristically existential. There are key considerations which are at the heart of humanity's existence and survival, inviting us to address the stakes with a sense of preparedness for the future, maximizing various existing entry points. One, learning and doing. The old maxim, learning by doing, voiced by UNESCO years ago, is still relevant today in our interaction with emerging futures. It is still true that schooling is not equivalent to education. Even with the flood of information on the internet, the role of the teacher is still relevant, but it should be less as a managerial, magisterial lecturer, and it should be more as a coach to enable students to critically analyze a variety of information. We need to be aware of the adage that Information is not necessarily education, and propaganda is certainly not education. Even though the pandemic has made field visits and field work more difficult, access to life situations is still important to enable students to learn from real situations and to appreciate the wisdom of the many catalysts along the way. Hence experiential learning. Cross-disciplinary, cross-cultural, and interdisciplinary knowledge and learning are to be nurtured, bearing in mind that there should always be room for the social sciences as a complement to the technological stream, as they are critical for a sense of consciousness and conscience about human interaction and the self-actualization of humans with a grasp of history. For example, it should not pass unnoticed that this past month witnessed the key resolution of the UN General Assembly, underlying the need to educate people about the Holocaust, whereby some six million Jews and other vulnerable groups, such as minorities and LGBTI people, were systematically exterminated by Nazis before and during the Second World War. Thus, there is a need to counter Holocaust denial, whereby misinformation and disinformation are regrettably encouraging people to deny that the genocide took place. Moreover, social discourse and social interaction, such as through sports, artistic events, community programs, and pro bono work to help marginalized groups are all lessons in socialization that enable the learner to appreciate the basics of life, not only materially, but also non-materially and spiritually life-based and lifelong. Literacy, please. Two including and participating. This entry point 
invites us to take stock not only of what is learned, but also of how it is learned. There's still the complementarity between substance and methodology. There are many settings, however, today where the methods of teaching and learning are not participatory enough as we prepare for our futures. Democratic space in the so-called classroom, whether online or offline, is an old new dilemma when faced with the opacity when and when learners are subjected to indoctrination without the space and freedom to participate actively in discussions with an open mind. We should not be disingenuous about the many non-democracies in the region where academic freedom is very constrained and educational freedom is heavily strained in such setting. However, even now there are already instruments in the educational toolbox which should be well used. The International Community Sustainable Development Goals SDGs have enjoyed universal buy-in by countries and their goals, targets and indicators set the tone for inclusion and participation. In particular, SDG 4 calls for quality and inclusive education with gender sensibility. It emphasizes not only primary education but also preschool and secondary education. Technical and vocational education is all the more important now to help people learn new technological skills, especially when work opportunities might no longer be linear in the sense of one lifelong job per one person. Thus, there is the challenge of adaptability with access to all persons without discrimination under the promise of leave no one behind. Three, caring and sharing. There are generally three components behind education. The fostering of knowledge, attitude and behavior of the human person that is responsible responsible and responsive to other persons and the environment. COVID-19 has accentuated the call for a sense of humanity linked with that trio behind the educational process which has become all the more needed when faced with deprivation and disparity. Activities that enable students and the general public to care and share are invaluable to offset the damage inflicted by the pandemic. The pandemic is also an opportunity to revitalize our responsiveness to the broader community and environment around us. One obvious global local challenge is climate change and the need to mobilize everyone to decarbonize and reduce waste. The world is not short of standards and there are plenty of treaties and action plans encapsulated by the Paris Accord on Climate Change, which builds upon the International Framework Convention on Climate Change. There is the well-known target to be realized, which is to ensure that global temperature warming does not rise by more than two degrees Celsius and preferably kept below 1.5 degrees. Measures are needed not only to mitigate the situation, such as to phase down, phase out the use of coal and to reduce dependency on oil and gas, but also to adapt to more sustainable practices, such as good town planning to address climate change and incentivization, such as tax relief, to enable the public to opt for solar energy and other green renewable energy. The potential to commit to all these measures will depend much on education from a young age that cares for and shares with others, together with respect for other forms of life on earth, 
and to face the fact that in a sense the future is already here as an existential challenge for all of us and our survival as a human race. There can be no sustainable future unless there is also a humane face gazing amicably at the panorama around and before us with a space for comprehension, a call to partnership and a commitment to action across the variety of generations with appreciation for responsibility towards actuality and posterity. Mirror side two, existentially futuristic. One business sector very recently listed five technological innovations which are up and coming. The Internet of Things, applied artificial intelligence, AI, such as to use AI for repetitive medical procedures, blockchains, the metaverse, and robotics. Education has to address the futuristic elements that are now dawning on us and which will appear even more evidently on the horizon very soon. At best, propitiously. At worst, ominously. Perhaps we can reduce those phenomena to the three A's represented by A for automation, A for algorithms, and A for artificial intelligence, discussed below. They all invite more responsiveness from the educational sector to ensure that they are at the service of humanity, implying more innovative education cum literacy to cater to the advent of futurism. 1. Automation A key consequence of the pandemic has been the shift to automation. The negative side has been rising unemployment and the question of how to revive access to jobs. Yet, machines are taking over the work previously done by humans. A key strategy is to enable the displaced workforce to reskill and upskill. In the meantime, there is the exponential growth of the digital economy, which demands a more skilled workforce, while necessitating the nurturing of new professions. When is automation unable to substitute for the human touch? In the book titled Artificial Intelligence 2041, penned by former Google China's executive Kai Fu Li and sci-fi writer Chen Zhu Fan, it is noted that three areas open doors to new types of work. Creativity, empathy, and dexterity. For example, the empathy industry would promote people who are needed to offer empathy to other humans. These include social workers, nurses, and psychologists dealing with the impact of digitalization, such as computer-related injuries and mental illnesses. A different kind of service industry has the possibility of emerging, complemented by new learning possibilities. How then to help those who are out of work and who have yet to find new jobs and activities. Another idea being touted is to offer universal basic income to everyone. Yet in UN circles, there is a divergence of opinions on this. Humans need more than such income because we all search for activities that are fulfilling and that enhance our self-esteem. Thus, constructive occupations are still needed even if the state provides some guaranteed financial support. Social protection is also essential to cover access to health care and other supports, including access to different forms of education for futures literacy, to enable people to recover, revive, and rebuild the basics of life. What about 
labor protection and the digital economy. There's a question as to whether gig workers who offer digital services from home interlinked with digital platforms are formal workers to be covered by the labor law. The latter may have to be adjusted to cover these workers explicitly. Hybrid work, work from home, alternating with work at the office, is already prevalent in many countries and it also needs education and monitoring to ensure fair labor practices. Two, algorithms. The issue of data and algorithms is all pervasive today. Algorithms are linked with digital equations and instructions that enable the profiling of consumers in terms of their behavior and have obvious implications in relation to the marketing of goods, targeting that behavior for commercial reasons. There are also privacy implications. Today, human rights conscious countries are increasingly adopting laws on the protection of personal data so as to enable people to safeguard their right to privacy and the need for their consent if their data are to be used. Colloquially, the right to be forgotten has emerged as a key concern. It implies that when your data are put on the internet against your will, you can demand their removal from the platform. In other words, to be forgotten. What if such data and algorithms are used for criminal purposes? There's now a move towards an international treaty on cybercrimes, but this invites education and caution because it may affect freedom of expression and may be abused, especially by non-democratic regimes. The preferred example on this front is the European Convention concerning cybercrimes, such as the Budapest, known as the Budapest Convention, to which some Asian countries are parties. Basically, the convention calls for the criminalization of specific internet-related activities, such as child pornography and fraud on the internet, rather than a general internet law which confers broad powers on the state to block information flow. Currently, a key danger in the Asian region is the emergence of internet gateway laws which enable the authorities to switch off the internet tap all too easily and arbitrarily. This will have great impact on education in general and the space for liberal learning and academic freedom. And three, artificial intelligence. As for the rise of AI, it is recognized that robots and the like can contribute much to help humankind. Two areas give rise to worries. A major concern is the use of AI for security and surveillance. An example is facial recognition technology, which enables the identity of persons to be singled out, especially in undemocratic settings. Regrettably, street demonstrators are identified remotely by such technology and are harassed by law enforcers and security personnel for repressive purposes. The human rights arm of the UN has already called for a moratorium on the use of such technology, and this is especially resonant for Asia. To counter an overly surveyed society, people also need education and literacy to protect themselves through digital security. Finally, there is the arrival of killer robots, which needs to be regulated. What is most concerning, however, is self-automated robots, which can decide to attack and kill of their own accord without being subjected to human command. The UN has also called for international regulation of these weapons, and the global public needs to be aware of the situation through broadened educational process, formally and informally. The most logical entry point on this front is to expand a treaty which already exists. 
The Convention on Conventional Weapons is directly relevant, and it prohibits, for example, blinding laser weapons. In future, this treaty might be expanded to prohibit killer robots which act beyond human command. However, many Asian countries have not signed up to this treaty and should be encouraged to do so. While the three A's have much to contribute to humanity, an existentialist question is whether in future that trio will overtake human intellect and know-how. That stage is called singularity. Yet there are two areas where those three A's are unlikely to supersede human capacity, at least in the short term, namely consciousness and conscience. With that added value amidst the emerging futurism linked with the trajectory of education and literacy, humans still need to be in control and to be accountable to be, quote, humans in the loop, unquote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Wittit. There is much to reflect from Professor Wittit's keynote address. Among many other points, he kindly highlighted that um, the future literacy offers us opportunity to reframe the panorama of education, especially as COVID-19 has accelerated process of adaptation and disruption, yet education is really important for us to cope with global challenges, including technological challenges, um, climate change, and I think it, including wars as well.